beautiful bookworms. Today is a beautiful fall day, so I am working outside. In case you're new here, my name is Kat, and this is Katie Reads Books. Today's video is another author interview with Michelle Wilson, who writes young adult fantasy. She's going to be talking about her series Gatebreaker and her Animated Academy series. She is a self-published author and is going to give us a little bit of insight into her experience with that so far. So something that I like to ask authors is if they have any pets. I do. I have three dogs. I have um, Herbs, who is a German Shepherd mix, and Tess and Crow, who are both Border Collies. And Tess actually turned eight last Saturday. It was Aww. her birthday. So. Do you do anything special for, for their birthdays? Um, when I lived in Lexington, there was this, um, like, it's called the Bluegrass Barkery, I think is what it was called, and they had, like, Especially like special treats for dogs and so I used to go get on like they used to do like little birthday cookies Oh, um, but no this time I did not um, Saturday was crazy. So poor Tess didn't get anything <laughs> I need to go get her a special treat and make it up to her, but Aww. she seems okay I did get the new dog beds this week all three of them. So oh well, that's that's a good treat <laughs> Yeah, so they're all laying on Laying on their new dog beds this week. <clears throat> I'm glad they like them. So, <clears throat> you also have a little bit of experience with dog training too, right? Yeah, I do. I uh, went through animal behavior college and mentored with a trainer out of Georgetown. Um, this has been a couple years ago. I really enjoy dog training. I thought for a while I wanted to do it as a career, but once I got married and moved to Berea, it just... Um, wasn't the path for me mm -hmm. and so I still really enjoy it and so I do train my dogs and I'll help like up friends and stuff with their dogs I enjoy the science behind it and I really just like working one-on-one -on -one with the dogs it's a lot of fun yeah yeah cool so is that like between your dog training and just I know that you've had you used to work with the health department for a little while so are there any things like that from real life that make it into your writing do you think yeah, well, a lot. Uh, well, I'm an animal enthusiast uh, mm -hmm. in general. So dogs, all kinds of animals. I was big in like National Geographic, and my dad used to get me. I can't remember what brand, like what company it was that did them, but I had these big binders, and like every month they would send you these little like uh, leaflets with like a different animal on them, and they were just like binders full of them. So I used to have those <laughs> when I was little. I always loved, but. Um, so that sort of love of animals definitely in in the books I have out right now it definitely um, comes out more in my Animage Academy series for like the main characters are all like shifters of some sort they all shift into a certain animal so mm -hmm. like different kind of animal aspects come out there um, I don't have any like major dog characters yet which is kind of funny but and then I did work a lot with like community coalitions and then nonprofits and did a lot of like convincing people to do like implement programs mm -hmm. or so kind of like human and I, I was also a psych major so definitely that kind of like human relations and how like you know coming going in like I worked in a lot of different communities in central Kentucky and even like how it was really interesting how even to communities that are like right next to each other maybe like five miles apart like they have different needs and they have different thoughts and like the people that sit on you know these community community coalitions like bring different things to the table and everybody's coming from a different background and a different perspective and so definitely I think that plays into a lot of some of the interactions and and more so it definitely will play more so into um my gate breaker series is like these these characters sort of like get enmeshed in like mm -hmm. the political intrigue of this like new country so oh fun um, so you're going to be able to implement a lot of your like conflict resolution knowledge <laughs> yeah yeah and sort of like how that looks and how and i don't really like i don't ever like i really don't base like any specific situations or any specific like people like off 
specific things that have happened in real life, but definitely all of that sort of knowledge and all that stuff that I've learned definitely plays a part. That's awesome. That's really, it's a lot of fun. So you mentioned your anime series. So where did you get the idea for Anime Academy and how did you start building out that world? Well, I, um, I've had this idea for a long time of sort of like, because I've always liked the idea of like shape shifting and shifters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, and I, so I've always had, I've always, I had like the idea of this certain like class of like supernaturals who mm-hmm. could shift, but they, but they could only shift into one animal. And like they didn't get a choice on like, like sort of like an animal that kind of like mirrored their personality. Okay. And then that they had, but the, the opposite of that was like their human forms have animal traits, like animal physical traits. Mm-hmm. Like in, um, like I, in, like I've got a girl with like butterfly wings and I've got a girl, like a guy that has like a lion's mane or like people might have like weird eyes or like, and so like this kind of shit, like it's like a, almost like a reverse shift, like, and they don't have any control over that. Like whatever animal they, they are, they like automatically like wake up one day when they're around the time they start to shift and like suddenly they have these physical characteristics they didn't have before and so how that sort of like plays into it you know and so like I had that idea kind of by itself for a long time and then I've been reading a lot of academy books just in general I enjoy them you know this kind of like I always enjoy like coming of age sort of tales and Mm -hmm. so this you know magical people in schools and you know, con- like whatever conflict that brings. Um, so I've been reading a lot of those, and it just kind of hit me one day because, like, I'd always and then like the term anime came with like it was like anime academy, like it just hit me because <laughs> I couldn't even th- like I hadn't come up with the term anime yet, but I'd I'd long like had that idea and wanted to like put it into something. Yeah, because like I even played with that idea like putting it into the Gatebreaker, my Gatebreaker series, because I started writing it first right but it really it really didn't fit there it didn't really like fit with that magic system I couldn't like shoehorn it in as much as I tried yeah <laughs> and so it just like I was just I was actually just reading one day and it just like the the, the name came to me like Animage Academy and I was like that's it like that's that's ball game like that's how I can do this so and then from there you know I built out the, the you know the what I like I wanted it you know urban fantasy like set in our world but you know our world obviously is a fictional version of our world that has supernaturals but and so like and how it all fit together so yeah that was kind of the like moment of inspiration Uh, those little lightning bolt moments are really they're always fun you know yeah you you feel the epiphany and it's like (laughs) adrenaline yeah I was like that's it this is it this is how I can do this Oh, fun. So you mentioned Gatebreaker, which you've recently released a revision of. So what made, what, what drove your decision to revise Gatebreaker? Well, I wanted to do an audiobook, And so I was interviewing narrators and um, I was going through, like I always wanted to like go through it again. Uh, Gatebreaker was the first, my first book that I self-published. And so I made a few mistakes, like, mm-hmm. just along the way of, like, how I had it structured and, um, well, not, not really mistakes, like, I just didn't like the way it was structured, I guess, mm-hmm. once it, like, I had really short chapters, which works for a lot of people, but the more, like, I didn't really love it, um, and there were a couple of things, like, obviously, like, I've grown as a writer, I've published, uh, two more books since then, and I've got, you know, I've had, I've got a couple of anthologies under my belt, and so, as I was, listening to like the auditions for the narrator I decided I wanted to go through and just because I had never like kind of considered an audiobook and never really considered like how my book sounded like out loud on like, right. auditory, you know, auditory and so um but that's, that's one of the good things I love about you know self-publishing is I, you know, I have complete creative control over anything that I put out mm-hmm. and at the same time I Gatebreaker like all of my books were exclusive to Amazon and so I had and because mainly the reason I did that is because 
um, you know, Amazon is the largest ebook seller, and they make um, you know getting into their system super easy for people who want to self-publish. And so I wanted to really learn, kind of get my feet under me with like one sort of system first. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. but then, but I had like been doing it enough and like learned enough that like going, like it's called going wide, like taking your book to all retailers. Yes. Or I mean, you don't have to do all, but you know, if you're if you're at, if you're in more than one, you know, they call it, like that's kind of just the term they call it going wide. And so I, that always that had always been in the back of my mind as a goal. So I just decided to, as I, I just decided to do a whole, like, do a rewrite and fix anything I wanted to fix or change anything I wanted to change and do a, um, like, with the launch of the audiobook and at the same time launch the book wide. So it just kind of fit to be able to, like, do all of that at once. So, like, I took it down off Amazon and then republished it like a new and like the the main storyline of the book is the same. <clears throat> um, I added a few scenes, you know, a few like extra okay, scenes, Nick. and I changed the language. Read and get some um, like tips, just please. some of the language and the phrasing, and like rewrote some things. Um, but like the main storyline is still the same of it. But I wanted to just, you know, po- you know, it was brand new on all the other retailers, and so I redid it on Amazon. And it was enough of a change that it, it was, even though the storyline is the same, it was it was pretty substantial rewrite. So, um, so yeah, that was really I was like, let's just do it, you know, do it all at once, and do like a, a relaunch, if you will, right? Of the book. So, do you feel like you met your goals whenever you were, whenever you did that? Yeah, I do. Um, I, because I didn't want like anyone who had bought the book to have to rebuy it like I wanted them to read the new version if they wanted to but Mm -hmm. so um normally like the first place that we kind of get dibs on like a new book is my newsletter list but for them I offered um for a limited time so like people had to jump on it yeah but I offered Gatebreaker for free um as opposed to like you know just for them to go buy um because you know a lot of people in my newsletter had already read it once so right offered a lot and you know and I asked for reviews you know because and I got a few reviews on um, Amazon and on I've got a few on other stores as well already which is nice that is nice um so I definitely did more and you know I call them advanced reader copies or or arts Mm -hmm. um I definitely gave away more than I than I typically would um with a book launch for Gatebreaker because you know I didn't want anyone to to rebuy it, like of course, yeah. like I still want people to buy it, but like if they already bought the you know first version, I didn't want them to have to rebuy it to get the the new 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 newer shinier version. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, but it's been going well. Um, I'm you know figured out the other retailers and working with them, and that's that's really fun. And I've got the audio book is out now, and it actually just this week uh, went live on Audible, which was the last one I'm waiting for. I was waiting for so. Like, you can get the print book, or you can get the ebook, or you can get the audio book now on, like, on Amazon, or Nook, or Kobo, or, you know, whatever it is that you use to, to you know, read audio books, or read, not read audio books, <laughs> listen, read to books audio books. listen to audio books, right. so it's there and available, so that makes me happy. So, for any writers that might be watching, and this is not a question that I had jotted down, but what was your experience with the audiobook and creating the audiobook? How did that go for you? Um, it went really easy. Um, um, the production side of Audible is called ACX, and so um, so you. So you can make an account on ACX and actually like post post your sample um, and take auditions there. Like mm-hmm. narrators are already there. Um, there's another place called Find Away Voices, and I've not used them for the production side, but they but they are also they also produce and distribute audiobooks. Um, and I think they have a really similar process where you can like look for narrators. So that was really nice. Um, because I use use an ACX to like post my sample, give like a brief um, 
you know, this is what this book is, and, like, this is where, like, I want this series to go. And so I got, I got probably 10 or 12 auditions there. Um, and, like, they came in really quick. So, yeah. <laughs> and then I just, you know, went through them and, like, picked the narrator that I liked the best and talked to her. And ACX and um, actually has a way that you can do, it's called a royal, royalty share contract. And I actually considered doing that first where um, you don't have to put any money up front to mm -hmm. pay your narrator. They get paid. Like you go, your your audiobook in that case is exclusive to ACX and or you know, it'll be on Audible and iTunes. Right. It's, like it gets used. Um, but like your narrator then gets paid. I think the contracts are five to seven years. I can't remember exactly. Um, and the, like your narrator then gets paid, gets a portion of your royalties, you get a percentage of your royalties, but it's all taken care of through the ACX system. Um, so that's really nice for people that maybe not, maybe want to get an audio audiobook out there, but don't have um, like the upfront cash to like pay a narrator. Right. Um, but I, so I thought about doing that, but then I decided since I was taking the book wide. I wanted to take the audiobook wide as well once I learned more about that. And so we ended up doing just a, you know, per hour contract. Um, and my and my narrator was great. Um, and so she, it's, it makes it really simple. Like she does, you know, her recording and editing of the recording thing and uploads it into the ACX system. And then it's right there. I can listen right from their website. And then once it's done, like you have to do, like you approve a 15 minute segment Mm -hmm. And then you approve, like, and then like you approve the audiobook at the end. But the way my narrator did it is, she actually just went ahead and like uploaded each chapter as she went. And so then I tried to like keep up with her and listen to them as she uploaded them. So in case there was something that we needed to change, she was able to do that then. Um, so yeah, so it was great. I can't wait um, to use her for the rest. I mean, I'll, I'll hopefully be able to use her for the rest of the Gatebreaker series. <clears throat> right. As I get it written and do. Um, but, yeah, it was super. And then once, you know, once it was done, she sent me, like, I we had the audio already in the ACX system for it to get approved through Audible. And then she also sent me the recordings that I then uploaded, you know, other places to right. distribute it wide. So. <clears throat> and so, yeah, it was really, overall, it was really simple. That's really awesome. So, are you planning on also doing a revision of the second book in the Gatebreaker series, uh, Magic Builder? Yes, I am. Um, it's going to be more extensive than the first one, I think. Um, I'm actually going to dive into that hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it on my uh, game plan to do. But yeah, I'll be revising book two, and then book three isn't out yet. So, like, from book three on, they'll be just that you know, right. books, so. Cool. So you mentioned that these revisions is are part of the bright side of self-publishing is the ability to go back in and, um, you know, fix whatever it is that you feel like you need to, to tweak. Um, so what are the other bright sides of publishing and then what are the, maybe the not so bright sides of self-publishing? Um, I mean, being your own, you know, entrepreneur, um, is I think one of the big bright sides of self-publishing. Um, you know, I it's you know I've got total creative control over my product basically mm -hmm. over my book. So if I want to write something like my Animage Academy series is certainly in a like a popular genre right now. Like if I want to write something that's in a popular genre, I can. If I you know want to write something that's just something that you know anything I just want to put on paper that's creative and that like I want other people to read like I absolutely can do that I don't have to worry about you know finding an agent or querying or you know going through the whole multi-year process mm -hmm. of um you know of the traditional publishing industry and there's right. you know I mean not that it's bad if people I mean a lot of people love you know being traditionally published and that's great but you know when I like for Gatebreaker, like, even the, you know, doing the revisions, like, it took me a matter of months. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, writing and publishing, like, it's not taking me longer than six months to, to from, like, writing it and publishing it 
on any of the books that I've done. So it definitely, there's definitely a, a quicker turnaround. Right. Um, and I just like, I like, I enjoy it. I enjoy doing the marketing. I enjoy learning about it. You know, so it's definitely, uh, some people hate that kind of stuff, <laughs> and, which is, you know, maybe a reason, you know, maybe they might not want to go the self-publishing again. But I really like being more in control of my product and more in control of, like, my finances and, you know, how that works. Like, right. being my own, you know, it's it's more like I feel like I, I am an author, but I'm also a, a publisher. You know, mm-hmm. I'm also kind of like an entrepreneur right. in a sense. Um, and the downside is, um, you know, you don't have a team immediately. You kind of, like, when you get, you know, offered a contract by... A publishing house like in, in the traditional sense um, you know they usually have editors there you know they usually go like your book through goes through a lot of steps and you've already got that sort of cover designer and editor and you've already got people who have put books out there before who kind of know what they're doing and know the system and know how it works so there's definitely a lot to learn in that aspect I have a cover designer now that I love but mm-hmm. you know it took me a while to find her Right. You know, I have an editor that I love, but again, it took me a while to find her. And right, so and that was a financial investment people, too. To yeah, yeah, to, yeah. You know, as yeah, because that's you know, with traditional publishing, that's kind of the thing. Like sometimes you'll get an advance, sometimes you won't. It just depends on what's going on. But yeah, once you sign that contract and it goes to that publishing house, you know, you don't, you're not out anything. Right. But as a self-published author, yeah, like if you want like you probably need to pay someone to edit um you probably unless you unless you have great editing skills you know you probably need to pay like I know I am not a graphic designer <laughs> so like I certainly could make my own cover but they are would certainly not be anything anyone wanted to look at so <laughs> it you know you want to so you know finding a cover designer was definitely something like I needed to do so there is that, you know, financial sort of investment in your book that's on, that's on you. Right. Um, and there are some opportunities that are still limited as far as, um, you know, with self-publishing. There's It's harder to get into bookstores in print form. Not impossible, but it is more difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, the traditional, you know, publishing houses have been doing that forever and ever. And they've got, you know, contracts with big box stores and wholesalers um, and the whole nine, yeah. yeah. And so it definitely, um, and two, just with like design, there are some things that are harder to do. Um, you see a lot of books that have like, have like really pretty end pages or like foil stamps or like special edging. Mm-hmm. Um, that stuff is not impossible, but it is difficult. And, and sometimes for self-publishing, when a lot, most people do what's called a print on demand or like pod service. Like mm-hmm. Amazon has their own pod service. You know, there's Ingram Spark has theirs. Um, Barnes and Noble has theirs. And so basically, what happens then if someone like buys a book, it, it gets printed then. Right. But whereas like traditional publishing usually does like big print runs. Mm-hmm. So like they'll they'll automatically make like thousands of a certain book depending on like what the how many pre-orders there is or what the market looks like you know they've got their own formulas for how they do it so some of the kind of like special printing um like the deckled edges and the sprayed edges and all those like right, fancier the things spray that... or, you know <clears throat> even like getting your book into a book box there's mm-hmm. not a lot of them to do uh, self-published books at this time you yeah. know they you know work with like, publishers to do like special print runs and that kind of thing. So some of those, and two, like even you see like really pretty like box stuff, like box sets mm-hmm. of like a series. Like those are a lot harder to do if you're self-published, especially if you don't have any sort of like background in like printing or design. Right. So like some of those opportunities are still not impossible, but still limited, especially for someone like coming in without any prior knowledge of that kind of industry. Right. So there's just like there's a huge learning curve with with the yeah. self hub. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is. And I I enjoy it. You know, I really do. Like, I enjoy learning about the marketing. I enjoy learning about the, you know, so it definitely is. When it comes to that, like, for some people, that's really overwhelming. Yeah. 
um, understandably. So, you know, there's it's a lot of hats to wear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you also mentioned that you have a couple anthologies under your belt. So what are the differences? What do you enjoy more about short stories and what do you enjoy more about writing novels? Um, novels let you kind of explore more. I really enjoy, I really enjoy writing short stories. They're probably one of my favorite. Like, I also enjoy novels, but, um, I've always really liked short stories because they tend to focus on, like, some, like, for me, like, when I write them, like, I tend to have, like, one kind of focus. Like, maybe mm -hmm. theme, I guess. Even, you know, like, one, one thing that I want to do in this story. Right. And whether that's, like, a plot point or a character thing or what have you and so it's kind of fun to, to sort of put a magnifying glass on whatever it is and and all of my short stories tend to like bring in some mystery of like some sort of like larger world but you know they really focus on that you know whatever that thing is mm -hmm. and so like I really enjoy kind of writing like that novels um are obviously more more expansive and and so there's a lot more that you want to bring in, like a lot more, a lot more setting, a lot more like character development, a lot more, uh, you know, plot points or what have you. And so um, there, I mean, there's two sides of like when it comes to writing, they're just like two for me. They're kind of two sides of the same coin. Like they're both writing, and I enjoy them both, but it just like works my brain a little different, um, gotcha. depending on which one I'm watching. Have you ever written a short story and then ended up turning it into something bigger? You know, I haven't. I have a couple that I could. Um, I do have a couple of short stories that kind of, and I'm working actually now on a novella that'll be kind of a prequel for the Gatebreaker series. Mm -hmm. So, like, it'll kind of have a different focus. Like, it, it'll still have that kind of, like, one. Like, it won't be, it's not going to be, like, right in the timeline of like the Gatebreaker series, but it'll definitely be like set in that world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I kind of, like that'll be kind of fun. Like I'm in the middle of like plotting it and drafting it right now. Um, be fun to like do it in that world, but with kind of a different, you know, like a different sort of focus or a different time period, but still bring in those like things that I know, you know, so it'll, it'll connect to it, I guess. Right. Um, but that's really, I've not really done that specifically. Um, you were one of my co-authors <laughs> of the Dragon, our Dragon, um, Dragon Keepers mm -hmm. Academy anthology. And so that was, you know, a series of interconnected short stories. So like all of, all of our stories were set in the same world at the same school, you know, within the same year. So that's probably the closest that I've come to kind of like, either doing a short story and making it bigger or, you know, writing kind of a short story in a world. So that was a, that was a fun, fun sort of writing experiment. That was, that was a fun little challenge. Um, so your Gatebreaker series is Portal Fantasy and mm -hmm. Animage Academy series is Academy Fantasy. What are the challenges of those two genres and what draws you to those two genres? Okay, well, Portal Fantasy, <laughs> the Gatebreaker series really, like, literally started with the idea, like, Narnia, but, like, what if they didn't have to leave? <laughs> like, well, like, I love the Narnia books, and I've always loved them, but I always, like, in the, first, like, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe book, there's just, like, a paragraph of, like, how they, you know, these kings and queens of Narnia lived there for, like, a whole lifetime, and, like, that's all, and I always, like, even as a kid, I was like, well, that's what I want to know about, like, <laughs> I want to know about all of this, like, time. but no, when they find the lamp, like, I always get so mad when they, like, find the lamppost and end up back <laughs> yes. to the wardrobe. I'm, yeah, like, who chooses not, to go like, back to like, the normal were world? <laughs> and queens and they were talking animals, like, go back. And the, you know, and like the kind of the point of Narnia is like Narnia chooses when you come and go and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And But I wanted, I guess, the characters to have a little more agency in that. And yeah. so that, that is sort of the idea. And like, they, like, Gabe Brecker is going to be a longer series. Um, 
And so, like, the characters really haven't, like, wrestled with that idea yet, but that that's sort of where it came from, and so that's why I really wanted to write, like, a, like I've always liked portal fantasies like that. Yeah. But, you know, I wanted to, that was sort of where the idea came from, like, in Narnia, but they don't have to, <laughs> don't, there's more time spent in that, that world. Um, so it's, uh, portal fantasy is a, it's not extremely popular, like, like trendy I guess it's always popular like there's there's always those you know there's there's Narnia there's always those books mm-hmm. that we know that are portal fantasies that people like it's kind of like a but, niche you know, genre Wonderland was Paws, like all those are like portal fantasies mm-hmm. so like it, it, it's a defined genre but it um or I guess technically it's a trope I don't know whichever <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing that people know about right right <laughs> um so, but it's not right now. It's not super popular. So, uh, marketing the Gate- Gatebreaker series has been a little more difficult with uh, with it being a portal fantasy. Like when people read it, they they really like it. Mm-hmm. But it kind of toes the line. Like it's not technically an epic fantasy series. So, like if you're specifically looking for epic fantasy, you're not really maybe going to pick it up. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not it's not urban fantasy either. So it kind of like and those are kind of really kind of too popular popular genres right now it kind of you know it's somewhere in the middle right so um you know people aren't and there's not a ton of people right now looking specifically for portal fantasies so that's been a little more difficult um the perks of parts of kind of like right just in the writing of it as opposed to the marketing is you know you you do get to play like with these characters that have like a lot of the knowledge we have like of our world like how they just you know and you know they just end up in this whole brand new world like how that sort of that's a lot of fun like how do you how do how do they discover things and like what do they know what do they not know like doing the world building through learing about the world from the care as the character exactly like and how how to write that without like it just being like info dumps for Mm -hmm. your characters or, or the reader and so like that's a lot of fun as far as like how the mechanics of writing go like what do you want your characters to know about this world like what do you want to find out I also like I've outlined I've been outlining more lately but Mm -hmm. I'm you know a pantser when it comes to like writing (laughs) most of the time yeah so sometimes I'm discovering things about this world as my characters do (laughs) right or I'll just be writing something like have an idea and I'm like okay that's what's happening (laughs) so um so that's kind of fun like sometimes I feel but like I am also learning about this new world with my characters. Right. Um, the Academy Fantasy, um, long tail that genre, like the genre, Animage Academy, is a young adult, um, urban fantasy academy series. So it's okay. like, so it's it's broader. It's urban fantasy, but then it is like in this sort of like niche niche. I don't know how you say that word. I don't know um, I always say it wrong. Genre. Um. <laughs> And so it that one, as far as marketing goes, it is more popular right now. Like there are people looking. Like I, I've got way more organic sales from the Anime Academy series just because people are people are looking for that. You know, they're looking for Academy books, right? You know, Supernatural Academy books. So that's been a little easier as far as like finding that readership. Um, the Academy fantasy, especially it being urban fantasy, like, it's set mostly in New York, and so I've been to New York once, but not, like, I didn't say they're super long. It's been years ago. Mm-hmm. So I've had to do, you know, fantasy is a little easier because, like, there are some things you have to do research for, but most of the time, like, you can just make it up. Because it's right, fantasy. yeah. Uh, like, you just have to follow the rules of your own making. Right. And so urban fantasy is harder because... <clears throat> excuse me sorry because i've set you know it's in the in the real world like right. obviously i want things to be realistic and so trying to uh research and you know there's more research a little more like i have to watch what i'm doing even even things as little as uh my editor caught it one time like i had a full moon and then a new moon like two nights in a row, which obviously is not, you can't do that. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> it's not possible anymore. <laughs> and so, like, even little things like that, especially when I tend to just kind of, like, go for it and write, um, I have to be careful to, like, either research beforehand if I know what scene I'm going to write or, or, like, make sure I go back and kind of, like, back check 
myself. Right. Um, it maybe it feels a little more confining off. than, yeah. Yeah. And so that's been, for, and for me, and some people, you know, that's been a little harder for me. Some people really, like, love urban fantasy because of that. But, like, as far as the writing goes. And with Academy Fantasy being kind of more more of a genre story, genre writing, there are more tropes that I, like, I am trying to, like, be sure to hit. And, like, they all work within a story. And, like, I, you know, sometimes, like, writing certain tropes or stuff gets a bad wreck a bad rap but mm -hmm. you know I like I enjoy it like I mean I enjoy writing in an adult fantasy that's that's I, what I read that's why I like writing it you know I've never written even if it's more of a genre story doesn't mean I don't enjoy it you know right. doesn't mean I'm just writing it because it's popular or whatever mm -hmm. like I do enjoy it but because it is in that genre like I want to make it true to that genre and there are like more tropes that like I try to hit with it so right so yeah, so that just, so it's a little more difficult in some aspects. Like while it's easier to market, it's, it's a little harder to write. So. Right, yeah. Okay, so cool. So you've got, so like the new things that you've gotten out are your 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 new shinier version of Gatebreaker. You just released mm -hmm. the audiobook for Gatebreaker and are you you're currently working on a on a novella for gatebreaker so are you planning to do um another anime academy book what else do you want your readers to know that are kind of you know viewers to hear coming up about you yeah well um yeah i'm working on a the novella for the gatebreaker um like the gatebreaker novella is probably going to be the next thing that comes out um, and that'll be, I think I'm, it's going to be in an, like an anthology with other, other novellas by other authors. So, um, I think it'll be released in January. And of course, um, you know, I'll give, you know, I'll have more information. Most of my information, like you can find on my website, which is michellereneewilson.com. Um, and then of course I have a Facebook page and an Instagram. Those are the two social media outlets I'm most active on. Mm -hmm. And I've got a newsletter as well, um, which you can sign up on the website. Um, but so I've got that coming out. I'm also working on book two of the Gatebreaker series to re-release it. And then um, I am working on book two of Animage Academy too. Um, this year has been for a lot of people for a lot, a lot of reasons, a little, <laughs> harder to plan and get things done so I don't have any I don't have any um the novella is the only one that I have a specific you know when it's going to be out mm -hmm. date for but yeah those are all um and all and in all you know Animage Academy I plan on it being four books okay. and then um Kate Wrecker is going to be eight books so it's obviously going to take me a little bit longer to get to the end a bit okay you're welcome I just yeah. don't realize that I didn't have them like displayed anywhere so we'll show your <laughs> so dragons and destiny yeah. that one's dragons and destiny which is book one for anime academy and then you've got your you had two different covers for gatebreaker right the release cover was a little yeah, different I had than the this first one. one yeah that's the that's the pretty shiny one and the first one was good too but this one's more um sort of in line with the with the you know epic kind of fantasy look I was going for. Right. Yeah. And then the second book for Gatebreaker is Magic Wielder. Your your cover designer does brilliant work. That's just she, she really does. She that's, that that's gorgeous. Her. She is Kelly York from Sleepy Fox Studio. Okay. Is my cover designer and she is amazing. That's awesome. I yeah. Love her. Like I I just if I had like unlimited money I would probably just buy covers from her. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that that saying about crafting where it's like uh buying book covers is a hobby and it's different than actually using the book covers yeah right actually like writing the book, the book covers oh yeah totally. i'm not going to tell you how many covers i have that i have purchased that are just like on my computer for a future future, future story <laughs> yeah. but yeah but that's like yeah the the gatebreaker the prequel novella will be out soon and then the um Booked, both book twos and Gatebreaker and Animage Academy. Very cool. So it's coming down the pipeline. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all so much for watching today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to reading all of your comments down below. 
give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video and when I go live on Saturdays for our reading and writing sprints. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Katie Reed Author, and I hope to see you guys again soon. Bye.